very good evening to you and many thanks for joining me on yet another edition of Doctors on Call with me, Sharon Ongao on Serio. Now today on the studio, we're going to talk about obstetric fistula. According to a report by the World Health Organization, they record that obstetric fistula affects 50,000 to 100,000 women worldwide each year. And in Kenya, two women get obstetric fistula per 100 births. This results in 2,400 new cases annually. And due to this, that's the reason why we having this show today. And to help me with this subject of discussion, I have obstetric gynecologist in studio to help us with this show. And apart from that, I have live medical students who will be able to interact with us in one way or the other as we progress with the show. Let me start with the introductions. As per the normal, I'd like my guests to start introducing themselves. Let me begin with my immediate right. Uh, good evening. My name is Charles Moriuki. I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist working with MP Shah Hospital and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot, Charles. My name is Dr. Gerald Boutissia. I'm also an obstetrician gynecologist. Recently finished my school in Kenyatta. I come from the county of Kitui. Thanks a lot, Charles and Gerald, and Phil Atom. And to you, Atom, if, if you have any question regarding to obstetric fistula, can you reach us out on the number 20316, or you can WhatsApp us on 0786-316-316. Maybe, Dr. Charles, as we begin with fistula. What is fistula? So a fistula basically is a communication between two cavities. Um, and in scientific terms, we talk about communication between two mucosal surfaces. But for um, in, in a break it down in a way that is understood, it's basically a communication between uh, two cavities. And in this context, um, when we talk about obstetric fistula, we're talking about a communication between the birth canal or the vagina with the bladder or the cavity where the urine is kept, mm -hmm. or a communication between the birth canal and the rectum where the stools uh, or the stool uh, does pass through. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that that communication allows the contents of the bladder to come through the birth canal or uh, allows the contents of the rectum to come through the birth canal as well. Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe as I was doing my research, I realized that fistula, there are many types of fistula. Maybe tell us the, mo the most common types of fistula. Uh, now, the, the most common types of obstetric fistulas, to be specific, mm -hmm. the, the, the commonest is uh, what you call vesicular vaginal fistula, which is basically a connection between the bladder, where the urine is kept, to the vagina, where the baby comes through, this is then followed by what we call rectovaginal fistula, which is another connection between the rectum and the birth canal, the vagina again. Mm -hmm. And then the other third commonest is uh, what we call ureterovaginal fistula, which is basically a connection between ureters, which are the tubes that bring the urine from the kidney to the bladder mm -hmm. and to the vagina. Mm -hmm. Yes. So apart from the obstetric fistulas, which, which other fistulas are also common? Yes, there are other varied types of fistulas, mm -hmm. but um, <clears throat> probably related to connection between um, intestines and other part of the body, or an intestine and uh, the, uh, the outside part of the body. Yes. Now, according to the research of the WHO, they say that in Kenya alone, there are 2,400 new cases annually. Is it that there's something that's going on in the country, or is it that with the women after conception, they don't plant themselves? What do you think? Um, that's a broad question, <laughs> but maybe if we try and break it down, I think um, there are several causes to it. Um, some of it could be in, in the context of, let's say, um, we, we call them patient factors, where the patient is at risk of getting a fistula. For instance, if they've had multiple surgeries before, um, and for instance, they, they eventually have a repeat cesarean section, yeah. uh, they are at risk of getting a, an injury to the bladder, and that can now communicate uh, with the vagina or the birth canal mm -hmm. and, and cause a fistula. But the commonest actually is um, actually related to obstetric fistula due to um, uh, prolonged labor. Where that for, is the most common That's case. the most common. And actually even not just in Kenya, but in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. So what happens is that um, for one reason or the other, the baby's head is in the birth canal, but the baby is not uh, able to come out. And, and that pressure of the baby's head on the bladder uh, allows for the weakening of, uh, of, of, the, of the surface between the, the two. And, and slowly with time, there is a hole or a defect that uh, comes about either soon or, or, or during the delivery process. Mm -hmm. So that is actually uh, the commonest. And basically, we're talking about women who might be in far-flung areas, or what call arid and semi-arid regions, mm -hmm. unable to access uh, proper medical care mm -hmm. or the intervention in time. Mm 
-hmm. Yes, though that can actually still happen in our context in, in urban settings where there could be a delay for one reason or, or the, the other. other. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, Dr. Mutisi, apart from the prolonged labor, is yes. there any other factor that causes fistula, obstetric fistula? Yes, specifically for, for obstetric fistula, apart from the obstructed labor, mm -hmm. we also have what we call hydrogenic. This is a scientific term that means uh, it is a fistula that is derived from medical interventions. This, this could either be a surgery, mm -hmm. either during the delivery, or could also be from assisted deliveries like using forceps. So that is the other common cause of obstetric fistulas. Mm -hmm. Yes. And other medical conditions that can cause obstetric fistula, is there or any? Normally, actually, the other thing would probably highlight is maybe during delivery, maybe it was not obstructed, okay. but maybe there was, for instance, a, a, a tear, uh, or maybe a, an episiotomy or a cut was given. And for one reason or the other, there was an extension of that cut, or mm -hmm. the tear was uh, what you call a major tear, and there was communication between the rectum and the vagina, and maybe it was not noticed or picked during the delivery, or it was not repaired correctly. So later on, a woman might complain mainly of a uh, uh, rectal vaginal fistula, which is a communication between the rectum uh, and the vagina. When you say it was not picked correctly, does it mean that even with fistula there is a misdiagnosis? So sometimes, especially for uh, fistulas, they don't tend to present immediately. Okay. Sometimes there's that lag period where um, in an attempt for the tissues to heal and recover, sometimes a defect might appear. Or, um, for instance, during um, a delivery, uh, there could be a small nick, uh, a small hole that was missed, mm -hmm. communicating between the rectum and the vagina. And, and, and later on, this is, uh, you know, presents itself as, uh, um, with the symptoms of a fistula. But at that point in time, uh, it was not obvious to, to, to whoever was conducting the delivery. Mm -hmm. yes. Before I embark on taking some questions from the students, let's talk about the symptoms for yes. fistula. Uh, now, the symptoms of the fistulas are related to the type of fistula. Okay. Um, so if it is a vesicle vagina, which is a connection between the bladder and the mm -hmm. vagina, uh, the patient will complain about continuous urine leakage that the patient has no control over. Mm -hmm. And of course, the amount of leakage depends on the size of the fistula. A big fistula means more leakage. A small fistula means slight leakage, mm -hmm. but both of them are still continuous, and the patient has no control over the same. Uh, when it comes to the rectovaginal fistula, mm -hmm. this is the connection between the vagina and the rectum. So now this is means that um, uh, the, the major symptoms are feces related. Okay. So either one, the patient does not have control over their feces, mm -hmm. um, given that probably they are, um, they are sphincters, the, the valves that control the feces were torn, as my colleague had, had, had alluded earlier. Or uh, you could also have a small hole that connects the rectum to the vagina. Mm -hmm. So some fecal matter leaks from the rectum into the vagina. Mm -hmm. And the patient is um, able to elicit that there is fecal matter that is coming out from her vagina. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, which was the connection between the ureters, the tubes that bring the urine to the blood, to the vagina, also presents the same way with the first one, where you have continuous leakage mm -hmm. of urine through the vagina, mm -hmm. yes. What happens in a scenario whereby a woman has, maybe she developed like two types of fistula in one person? What happens in such a scenario? Um, now, uh, the, the two types of fistula will present with a combination of symptoms. Okay. If it is a combination of um, a connection between the blood and the vagina, there is a urine leakage. And if at the same time, there's also a connection between the rectum and the vagina, mm -hmm. there's also stool leakage. Mm -hmm. So it will be a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, at this juncture, let me take some questions from the medical students. Can you introduce yourself by telling us your name? Thank you very much. My name is Meka Nyamwega. I am pursuing medicine and surgery, and uh, I will kindly request if you could please explain if this uh, obstetric fistula can also be congenital. And second, I could also ask, uh, uh, can it heal on its own? All right, let me take the first question. Maybe Dr. M. will start. So most, there are sometimes there you can have, um, when you say congenital, basically means that somebody has been born with this uh, condition. Mm -hmm. And there are times when you can have a complication uh, during the developmental uh, stages when the baby is inside the uterus. But more often than not, actually, majority of the fistulas that uh, are picked are actually uh, uh, obstetric related. Mm -hmm. And there is, there's a communication between 
uh, two cavities. And in addition, maybe I'd also add that sometimes you might get maybe a patient who had a communication, maybe a complicated surgery, and there was a communication between the ureter mm -hmm. and the uterus. So sometimes what happens is that they might notice that uh, uh, from time to time there could be uh, a bloody urine. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is basically because as the menses are coming out, there are, are also uh, is communication between the, uh, the menses and the bladder. Or sometimes they might notice that sometimes whatever is coming out uh, is also bloody in nature. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that you also have to remember that it could be varied for some people. But as we say, once the symptoms are there, the best is to... Uh, see the doctor. Mm -hmm. His second question was, can fistula heal by itself? Maybe let's talk about the treatment for fistula first before we embark on that. Uh, now, in, in, in as far as the treatment of fistulas is concerned, there are several factors that come into play. Okay. Of course, the first one is the cause. And uh, if the fistulas are related to the bulk, to what we are talking about in, uh, in, 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 in the delivery of children, Yeah. Uh, most of them, depending on their size, they are usually amended through surgery. But then smaller fistulas, uh, usually we say less than one centimeter or so, ca can heal on themselves on the condition that there is continuous urine drainage from the bladder. That means the patient has a catheter that continuously removes the urine from the bladder so that there is no pressure buildup. So in the absence of the pressure buildup, the fistula can come back slowly Okay. and heal over time, usually between three to six weeks. Now, this depends with the tear? This depends with the size, the size, the size of, of the, the fistula, fistula itself. Mm -hmm. As far as the tears are concerned, this means the, the connections between the rectum and the vagina, mm -hmm. usually they don't heal on their own. They are usually amenable to surgery. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, let me pick another question from the students. My name is Kevin Olwar. I'm taking uh, nursing in uh, Kenyatta University. My question is, are there any home remedies to help cure this obstetric fistula, for example, like use of antibiotics? Yeah, is there any home remedy? Uh, unfortunately, there is no home remedy. Um, antibiotics basically would reduce the risk of infection. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, when you think about a fistula, it depends with the size. Small ones, uh, big ones, they still need um, the catheter to be put in place. Mm -hmm. And basically what happens is, it's almost like imagining mm -hmm. a balloon. So if, if, if there is um, a drainage, then the balloon is deflated. The bladder is like a balloon. So when it's deflated, there is chance of the healing process to take place. Uh, but there are no home remedies for, for fistula. Mm -hmm. And actually that's why many women would still complain of symptoms of fistula for more than even 10 years, because they are uh, probably having the same symptoms, and despite all home remedies, they've not achieved any, any cure. Mm -hmm. Meaning if fistula is left, it can't heal by itself? No, it wouldn't. Not unless uh, there is a, an emptying of that bladder to allow, and especially at that point in time when it happened, mm -hmm. that uh, you'd want it to, uh, to, to be given time to recover as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Keep There's your question. On that, uh, on that point on the home remedies. Usually what you are calling the home remedies are um, issues that are undertaken after surgery. So if, for example, a patient has had their fistula repaired, okay. then they are advised on, on modes of uh, softening their stools, on uh, advice of taking a lot of water so that they, con they, 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 they urinate continuously, and they also dilute the urine so that it does not irritate the repaired fistula. Mm -hmm. So those conservative methods usually work during the healing process after surgery, mm -hmm. yes. Now, is that a reason why women with obstetric fistula, they're normally advised to take more liquids? What's the reason under that? Yes, as, as my colleague has correctly explained, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the advice is actually to ensure that there is a constant drainage of the urine to allow, um, to prevent it from being concentrated. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to also help remove any bacteria that could potentially be in the bladder, that, that drainage just helps. And also, um, we know that uh, people who take plenty of water also, you know, it helps the stool become soft and avoid constipation, which is one of the other complications that we would not want a patient who has had a repaired fistula to encounter. Mm -hmm. yes. And is there any chance whereby fistulas can reoccur, like reoccurrence of fistulas? 
maybe in a lady maybe if a lady had a certain given type of fistula maybe the ne the other type maybe the next time he or she gives birth she also develops fistula is there recurrence yes uh for the part of recurrence we look at it in two ways okay one is that uh, a patient had a fistula that was repaired and possibly the, the post operative instructions were not followed so the fistula did not heal well so once the removal of the catheter is undertaken probably in three weeks or so, mm -hmm. the patient still has the, the symptoms of, of leakage. So that's one of the causes of recurrence or failure to heal. Mm -hmm. Now, the other aspect of uh, recurrence is that uh, once a patient has had a fistula and they still have not achieved their um, desired family size, which means that they, they, they are hoping to deliver in the future, okay. they are, we advise them that uh, vaginal delivery is out of the question. So we will not, um, we will not take her through vaginal delivery because of the risk of recurrence. So we, the mode of delivery now becomes a planned cesarean section delivery. Mm -hmm. Yes, now that limits the chances of a, of a, of a recurrence. Ah, okay. Yes. Dr. Mutisa, you talked about catheters. For yes. how long should a lady or a woman with a fistula have yes. catheter? Uh, now, usually the catheters, we, uh, we prescribe them after repair. Okay. So the, 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 um, the importance of the catheter is to aid what we have been speaking about, that the urine has to continuously keep on coming out. Mm -hmm. So usually after repair, we keep the, 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 the catheters for a minimum of two weeks. Okay. Then after the two weeks, the patient comes for reassessment and for removal. Okay. So if the fistula is healed, then there is no need for catheter anymore. Okay. Yes. Keep your questions coming. The number is 20316, or you can WhatsApp us on 0786-316-316. Let me just pick one question here. There's a person who is asking, is fistula a sign of cancer? Um, no, fistula is not a sign of cancer. Um, as we said, it's a communication uh, between two cavities. However, mm -hmm. advanced cancer, um, maybe in this context, genital cancer, can cause a fistula in the sense that uh, if the cancer develops to a state where uh, you know, it's not picked, it's not corrected, there's no treatment that is done for it, it can spread. And for instance, let's say cervical cancer um, can spread uh, from the cervix and go into the bladder. And eventually, then you have a weakening and there's a communication between the bladder uh, and, and the vagina. Mm -hmm. But a fistula in itself is not a sign of cancer. It's not a sign of cancer. All right, let me pick one last question before you take a short break. Uh, I'm Miriam Muzoni, a student nurse, Kenyatta University. My first question was bearing in mind that obstructive fistulas are the major causes of maternal death. How, which are the interventions to take to reduce these deaths? And then which are the post-operative care interventions that should be done to curb up this death? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe Dr. Mutisi will take the first question. Yes, I can take the first question. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the, my first point will be a point of correction. Mm -hmm. That fistulas are not a major cause of maternal death. The major causes of maternal death are bleeding, obstructed labor in itself, uh, um, hypertensive diseases of pregnancy, and infections more so in our, in, in our, um, in our locality, in the developing world. Uh, as far as the post-operative um, issues are concerned, we look at it in two ways. One is the postoperative aspect to prevent the occurrence of a fistula. That means close monitoring of a patient who has been operated on. So that just in case we see early signs of leakage, then that means that's a fistula that can be repaired within the first 48 hours mm -hmm. before the patient leaves hospital. The other aspect of postoperative um, management that we look at is uh, now a patient who had a diagnosis of a fistula and has been repaired. Uh, the issues we have spoken about earlier, making sure that the stool is soft through taking a, taking a lot of water. And, and also, patient can also be given stool softeners okay. if the water is not working. Like what? What are some of the examples of stool softeners? Now, stool softeners usually are drugs. Okay. They usually are drugs. One of the commonest drugs we use is Dufalac. They, 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 their mechanism of action is uh, they increase water loading to the stools so that the stool becomes soft. Okay. Um, the other aspect is the, 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 the continuous intake of water means that the urine is dilute. Mm -hmm. So it does not irritate the repaired, the repaired point of the fistula. So that means there is no impaired healing. Healing takes on well. And of course, we also give our patients some prophylactic antibiotics, mm -hmm. which uh, help in prevention of infection that can cause the fistula not to heal well. And of course, finally, is that uh, 
we advise our patients to abstain from sex. Okay. Because uh, during the healing process, uh, sexual intercourse can lead to a breakdown of the fistula. Abstaining should be after how long? We usually give them a minimum of six months. Yes, beyond six months now, we can reassess the patient and see whether they can mm -hmm. start engaging in Mm -hmm. Dr. Murika, I saw you jotting some things down, but just allow me to take this short break. I'll embark on you after this. Meanwhile, we're taking a short breather, but first, here's an insert on a certain lady we interviewed on a condition on fistula. Have a look. A fistula is an abnormal connection or passageway that connects two organs or vessels that do not usually connect. They can develop anywhere between an intestine and the skin, between the vagina and the rectum, and other places. Felistes, a mother of one and an accountant by profession, developed fistula 10 years ago when she was delivering her second-born daughter, who later passed on during delivery. It came to me when I was not aware, when I didn't know that there is a condition like that, when I was expecting everything to go good and when just that the way it happened when I was getting my child, because I actually went to the same same hospital, attended by the same same nurse, so I actually was 100% sure that nothing would be, you know, happen. What caused your fistula? It was out of a prolonged limba. I was there from 10 up to six. And then we also, you know, from 10 up to 6 p.m. Things did not even change. And then at around 8 p.m., the same, same day, that is on 23 December 08, the pains also continued. And uh, nothing could, uh, you know, there was not, no, there was no signs of, you know, mean delivering. What action was taken after that? From there, I was rushed to Kenyatta National Hospital. Upon arriving to Kenyatta, I was taken to the emergency. And then there I was put on oxygen. And then I just earned one word. Okay, let's hurry up. We save one life. Felistas had to undergo an emergency surgery. What happened after the surgery? Of course, I was not aware actually what was happening. And definitely from there, you are taken to a, a room to recover. That room I was, there was a nurse who was just seated there. So when I opened my eyes, I just asked to where is my child because I couldn't remember. I purposely went there to deliver. So when I went, I asked her, she told me, Nkai, kwanya So, kambia, then I asked, what, what is that I was not told? But your child passed, passed on. She was put on a special diet not knowing her condition. Because actually when you're in hospital, that is what diet you are being written to. Me, I was put to plenty, you know, plenty of fluids. So I could see when people are being taken to tea and brought milk and I'm being told to take plenty of water. I don't understand. I thought probably I'm in a special medical medication. So when the doctor came on the second day, then uh, I, I, you know, he just asked again how I'm doing. Again, he was told, then he just opened my file and said, ha, ah, but this operation, they could have done it this way and he removed the child safely. He said, why did they pull out the child and cause the condition of fistula? What was your reaction after being told that you had fistula? Because actually the situation was actually shocking, and I was shocked. So it also ended up of making my hood for CS burst. So when it's burst, because actually thinking that, you, you know, you're in pain, so you don't have your child, the condition that you see that you have developed, actually it is like, you know, it is scary. Later on, she was discharged from hospital, but when her condition worsened, she had to undergo a second operation, which was also not successful. So when I was done the operation, uh, then they, it was like, uh, it has, we have not done it successfully. Let's, Dr. Kisa say, let me go further to Kenyatta and do further investigation to see where the problem came. I actually know the doctor who did that one. Then from there, after that operation, I was left in much pain. And because the pain was too much, they were to do the research and look for a doctor from Canada who came and did. And actually after they did, because I, I was like, why am I having that, you know, much pain? But when they did the, 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 the surgery, what I was told, it is pass. 
But finally, the surgery was successfully done. What were the challenges that you encountered? I actually, there is much stress. No peace. You can go and vis you visit your friends. You cannot carry normal duties. You cannot go to work. By then, I was working in a school. So my job already had been taken over. So to me, I was like there. I've just, I'm going to live a useless life. The story is that he was being told, your wife will never be normal again. So it was like, that is the end of it. Look for another wife. That is it. And he stood to me. How did you manage your condition after leaving the hospital? From hospital, I was in discharge with my catheter. I was given a nurse to, you know, was teaching me how to take care of the catheter. It was a bar. There is no replacement. Where it has been fixed, it is the doctor. You even don't know. You can do it. It is so tedious. You see, like, you know, the process of urine, it's a fluid in the body. We by it flows automatically. And then we are advised to take plenty of water. You are, you, you, my hood, you know, the surgery hood and not actually heal. You cannot eat to, you know, to swallow in the belly. Otherwise, you just feel pain. What advice can you give to people with fistula? In the first place, follow doctor's instructions. Maintain cleanliness. I'm saying from sex till you are, in, uh, you know, advised by the, uh, the, the, the doctor when to do it. After the surgery, you can stay for six months. All right, welcome back. The show is Doctors on Call. We're streaming on Family TV and Family Radio 316. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, in studio with me is Dr. Charles Muriuki, who is an obstetrician gynecologist. And to my far right is Dr. Gerald Muticia, who is also an obstetrician gynecologist. Many thanks again. So maybe just from the case study that you've just watched. I want a quick reaction to the case study. Felistas has been, had been suffering from fistula from the year 2007. Up to this time, I think it's like around 10 years. Mm -hmm. Maybe like a quick reaction to the catheters. She's saying like she had to go with the catheters at home. Dr. Gerald, you're you are saying something about the catheters. Yes, I had uh, alluded to the importance of yeah. the catheter mm -hmm. in uh, management postoperatively of a patient who has had fistula repair. And she has brought up very pertinent points that one, the catheter is very uncomfortable. Number two, it, is, it has some social impact. It, 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 it attracts stigma. Mm -hmm. And number three now, there is the aspect of taking care of the catheter, mm -hmm. which on the last aspect, at least she says correctly that she was told on how to take care of the catheter. Mm -hmm. So while it is, a, it is really a discomfort and a gross inconvenience to the patient, it is very necessary for the healing process once the fistula has been repaired, mm -hmm. yes. Maybe, Dr. Mutisa, what, what can you say about, Dr. Muriki, what can you say about the case study? Yeah, I think uh, probably my, my emphasis would be on how to prevent fistulas. Mm -hmm. I think prevention is better than cure, we all know that, but um, as, you hi, uh, as you had alluded to earlier on, and, and rightly put that, I mean, if you are estimating that for every 100 deliveries, there probably are two cases of fistula. Mm -hmm. What you're simply saying is, you're looking, uh, and the statistics seem to suggest that there could be probably 50 to 100,000 new cases uh, every year. And basically, if you look at our context in Africa, maybe the capacity that we have to repair these fistulas is maybe 10,000 per year. Mm -hmm. So what you're estimating is that there are probably more fistulas happening as, as the years go by than you can repair. Mm -hmm. So, uh, looking at this case and, and Paul Esana to, to Felicitas, it's, it's one of those um, sad stories because not only is somebody having a complication of, of, of um, a delivery mm -hmm. that requires surgery, but also the emotional time well of having to lose a child or a baby. So, we look at the several delays that you know, we, we usually would uh, comment on in obstetric care. And one of the delays is, ident is delay in identifying that actually there is need for medical care. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that could be in the context of somebody not being knowledgeable enough that actually, you know, I need to seek uh, medical care. Uh, sometimes you might have a delay in the decision making now to, to seek that medical care. And this decision making does not necessarily mean that somebody uh, cannot make that decision, but we're also talking about capacity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, capacity means that maybe someone does not have the money to access medical care and may be waiting for somebody to send money or, or something of that sort. That's then there's when also their due date is almost. When their due date is also, is, is, is close by. Yeah. 
So we, we usually would look at it and say there are several steps that can be done, especially in women who are pregnant. I mean, they can be able to uh, seek medical care early enough uh, during the antenatal clinics, um, have a birth plan um, in the sense that uh, there's a discussion about um, when the delivery date is, is likely to be, what is, the, what is the cost of the delivery, which hospital will somebody uh, you know, wish to, to, to seek medical care, and how do they access uh, this facility? For instance, is it, if it's at night, how will they be able to access the hospital? And that's one of the other delays that happens, that there's a delay in accessing. For instance, if it's in a far-flung region, the hospital is far away from where people live, maybe in a manyata. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you could have a context in Nairobi where there's too much traffic and somebody's trying to move across town to access uh, the facility of choice. And the last delay is really at the facility itself, where um, uh, the pregnant woman has arrived, probably in labor, obstetric labor, and uh, there is a delay in making the intervention that is necessary to prevent uh, a potential fistula and probably save the, the life of the mother. Mm -hmm. well, why do we say this? Because the care of fistula is, is, is not only tedious, but also requires um, a lot of skilled work. Uh, and, and, and there are complicated fistulas that will require um, uh, competent uh, fistula surgeons to repair them. Um, the other thing is, uh, not only is, is the care expensive, but there's also the stigma associated with it. Women are usually ostracized when they uh, are in society and you know, uh, there is leakage of urine, they are smelling of urine, they cannot yeah, you know, they be in public control, means. Yeah. Yes, uh, maybe there's leakage of stool. It's an embarrassing situation. Maybe the, the partner might leave them, they might be divorced. And, and when you look at this, this is a, a lot of emotional, emotional turmoil. It could lead to depression as well. Mm -hmm. So when you think about prevention, I think that is where we want to emphasize that this can be prevented. Uh, as well as also emphasizing it's uh, advisable to have delivery done by a skilled healthcare worker who will be able to identify that there could be a problem with the delivery. Meaning you don't advocate for home deliveries? We would not advocate for home deliveries, especially mm -hmm. in our context. We would advocate for delivery uh, by a skilled uh, healthcare worker mm -hmm. uh, who is competent enough to, to notice and also make appropriate and timely referral. For instance, in this, in this case, there could have been a delay I mean, she did mention that from, uh, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. there was a delay, was eight hours, and we don't know what was happening at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if it was identified earlier, and, and, and this would have been uh, a timely intervention if, if she was seen within the shortest time possible and have uh, had the appropriate care done at the, at the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. Thanks a yes. lot, Dr. Muriki. Remember, if you're listening to us on Family Radio or you're watching us on Family TV, the show is on obstetric fistula. You can reach us on 20316 or 0786-316-316. I have medical students in studio. Maybe at this particular point, let me just take some questions from them. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Julius Nyamawi. I'm a medical student in Yatu Kenyatta University. Uh, you've talked about uh, the catheters uh, related to fistula and stigma, because they attract stigma. So my question is, are there measures that have been put in place by medical professions to assist those, uh, those who are facing stigma in the society as a result of fistula? Mm -hmm. Are there any measures? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now just to comment on that. Uh, there are two stigmas that we have spoken about. The first stigma, which is the bigger stigma, is the stigma of having the fistula. The leaking urine, the leaking stool. It's a bigger fistula, I mean it's a bigger stigma within the society. So one of the major ways of tackling that, we have organizations that help in screening and sponsoring camps that repair women who have fistulas. So, the tackling of, 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 the, of that stigma is treating the patient who has a fistula. So once we treat these patients and they no longer leak stool, they no longer leak urine, then at least the stigma is over. The other day we were doing a camp in Nyeri and uh, there's one patient who had been repaired a fistula, I think a month earlier, and she came and uh, the only thing she wanted was to offer gratitude to the team that had repaired. And the issue was that during the time she had fistula, she had not attended church for like six years. But at least since the physical was repaired and her symptoms were resolved, she was very happy mm -hmm. that at least she could participate in church. She could sing in the choir that she was singing before. And she could participate in the smaller Christian groups. 
within the church society. So the fact that the repair of the physical was done means that uh, our stigma is over. The other aspect of the stigma of the catheter, we don't consider this a stigma as such because this is a transition period from the big stigma of having a fistula to healing process, then to a life without stigma anymore because you have no symptoms anymore. Uh, the, the stigma of the catheter is not big as such because most of the times during the recovery period, these patients are essentially confined at home. Mm -hmm. So they, there is not much interaction with the public that could stig st stigmatize our father. So at least that we don't consider it as a stigma per se. But from the patient's perspective, it's a point of discomfort and inconvenience. Mm -hmm. yes. But maybe I can have a follow-up question on that. Are all stigma-related conditions diagnosed in hospital? Or do ladies have these types of fistula maybe at home after delivering and everything? Are, they dete are all the cases detected in hospital? Uh, probably my, my colleague can answer. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think what, what you're trying to allude to is that does somebody always need to go to hospital? Yeah. To... And I think sometimes it's it's not easy um, to be able to be free with um, maybe relatives, and, and that's why we usually say it, it would be good to uh, seek medical care and see a gynecologist for that reason, and and be able to freely express what their concerns are. Sometimes the truth is um, you might need a bit more uh, awareness, and actually this is a program that I would actually I recommend. I think it's all about awareness, because yes. the reason why I'm asking you even this question, there are some women I've heard of their stories. They've been living with fistula for 40 years. Does it mean that they don't know the condition, or is it that they delivered at home? Maybe there was no medic to tell them that it is a situation that needs to be done? So, so I think one of the things that a woman, the, 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 the patient with a fistula might notice is something abnormal. Okay. The question is, where do they seek this assistance and help from? Mm -hmm. um, bearing in mind that sometimes they are grieving the loss of their baby, because most often than not, they will lose their baby. They might be uh, sent away from where you know, their matrimonial home is. Yeah. They might be separated from their partner. And, and actually looking at it and saying, there is an association between you know, obstetric fistula and poverty. Mm -hmm. So there is a possibility that the people who are actually suffering from fistula might not have the capacity in terms of the money to be able to access uh, proper medical care. Mm -hmm. But you know, as I was saying that, you know, a program like this is actually trying to create awareness so that there may be somebody listening on radio or watching on TV and has heard of something like fistula or maybe have been, has been suffering from this so that they, they, they know that there is hope and there is actually a possibility that they can be assisted uh, they might uh, maybe get contacts through uh, this program or be able to be connected to uh, the major fistula camps. And fistula camps, you know, happen from time to time in different towns just to try and uh, improve that accessibility of the fistula experts to the women in, in society and in community. Mm -hmm. yes. I don't know that you've ever heard of myths related with fistula. Maybe, Dr. Mutis, have you had, heard of any myth? To me, I've heard, like, fistula is a taboo. <laughs> oh, um, I, I'm not aware of any myth. Unless You've never uh, heard yes. of any myth. Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, the way my colleague has alluded here, mm -hmm. uh, fistula and uh, probably low education status, okay. low economic status, mm -hmm. they go hand in hand because of one, the, probably the patients are in far-flung areas. Mm -hmm. They are in uh, neglected places. Okay. So it is also uh, important to note that in such communities or subpopulations, the chance of a myth coming through is very high, mm -hmm. as opposed to an educated, literate, and well up society. Okay. Yes. Has anyone of you had any myth about fistula? Maybe to comment on it? Anyone? All right, let me take another question then. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Odiambo Jovin, a student doctor at Kenyatta University, and I have a question. So, how is uh, cancer therapy and cancer radiation in the boil areas related to fistula? And then, are there any other risks, apart from this risk of stool and uh, urine, are there any other risks related to fistula tracts? Mm -hmm. Maybe Dr. Muriti? Yes. Um, now, these are non-obstetric fistula, but you're talking about cancer-related fistula. As we um, had earlier mentioned, that they could be advanced cancer, and that that cancer being advanced can actually invade, for instance, the bladder, um, and that 
weakening. Uh, the cancer usually does not have strong tissue. There could be a weakening and allowing that communication. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, cancer treatment involves radiation therapy. Um, and you correctly said that sometimes the radiation therapy does make the, the, the cells or the tissue very weak. So sometimes that weakness and a loss of good supply of blood actually weakens the tissue and predisposes the, 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 the patient to having uh, you know, that communication or that fistula. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, there is, um, uh, there is a, an emphasis on you know, being able to know uh, what type of radiation dose is given and how best to ensure that, you know, that, that risk of uh, the fistula is, is reduced. Um, I don't know whether there, was, there must have been another question that he had asked. Apart from this of stool and urine, uh, are there any, uh, any other risks uh, related to fistula tracts? Yeah, so sometimes you might have the fistula area becoming, uh, there might be some scarring uh, on the inside. And, and actually, even after repair, that's one of the things that we always have to factor in. Mm -hmm. That sometimes, because of the scarring, there could be shortening of the vagina, which can actually make uh, a woman have challenges or sexual problems in the future. Um, the other thing that you know we also notice is uh, the bigger the fistula and the closer it is to the urethra where the urine comes out. Um, sometimes even after repair, there might be difficulty in, in the controlling mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes women might leak when they cough or laugh. And so we know that there is potential complications uh, with repair or even before repair with the scarring on the inside. Mm -hmm. yes. And again, the multiple infections that can happen. Sometimes with the fistula, there is communication between uh, two cavities, and, and sometimes they might get uh, bacterial infections that are resistant to, to, to several antibiotics. So that's one of the other complications that they might have. Okay, let me just take one last question before uh, we go on another short break. There's a person who is veering off from the topic. He's asking, does fistula also occur in men? Does it? Uh, in the context of today's discussion, which is obstetrics fistula, yeah. uh, that is fistula related to childbirth, mm -hmm. that particular type of fistula does not occur in men. It doesn't occur it in men? doesn't occur in men, yes. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we don't have men who do delivery of <laughs> <laughs> But uh, <laughs> we have other fistulas, like yeah. uh, during the presentation of the lady with the fistula case, they talked about the intestinal fistulas. Mm -hmm. Those ones can happen in men. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, thanks a lot. And on that note, we're taking a short breather, but here's an insert on Crohn's disease. Have a look. <laughs> Crohn's disease, also known as inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, affects the digestive tract and causes it to be inflamed. This can be experienced between the mouth, esophagus, stomach, and the colon. Although the exact cause is not known, doctors say genes, immune system, and something in the environment are factors that may aggravate the development of the disease. In people with Crohn's disease, something in your immune system causes an attack within the digestive tract. This causes the lining of the small intestine to be inflamed, which affects the ability to absorb water and other vitamins. Common symptoms of Crohn's are abdominal pain, diarrhea with mucus and blood, fatigue, and weight loss. Symptoms may differ from person to person depending on the location of the disease within your body. They may even change over time, however, it is important to keep track of them. Depending on the severity of the disease, some people develop symptoms that are not related to the disease. They include joint pain and swelling, redness or itchiness in the eyes, skin rashes and kidney stones. To get a better sense of your disease, your doctor may order a number of tests which may include blood test, stool test or a colonoscopy to help them see what is happening in your tract. Your doctor will prescribe medicine depending on how mild or severe your disease is. However, there is no standard treatment for everyone because each person's Crohn's disease is different. The medication could include pills, liquids, supercitries, which some are injected or given as intravenous infusions. You and your doctor will work together to find a treatment specifically for you.
In most cases, the preferred method of treatment approach is medication, but sometimes immediate surgery is needed. For example, when there is a blockage in the intestine, pus filled up in the abdomen, or a formation of a fistula. It is important to note Crohn's disease may appear at any age, but people between the ages of 13 and 30 are at a higher risk. You are at a higher risk of developing Crohn's disease if you have a close relative with the same disease. Research suggests that cigarette smoking increases the severity of the disease. It is important to stay informed as this may help you manage your disease better. All right, welcome back. The show is Doctors on Call. We're streaming on Family TV and Family Radio 316. Now, the show is on obstetric fistula. If you have any question on this, kindly channel them to the number 20316, or you can WhatsApp me directly on 0786-316-316. And with me in studio are obstetrician gynecologists, maybe from the insert on Crohn's disease. Maybe just a quick re reaction to it. What's the relation between Crohn's disease and fistula? Okay, so Crohn's disease is, um, is a condition that is associated with uh, uh, what you call like ulcers in, in the intestinal tract, okay, mm -hmm. basically from the food pipe all the way down. And sometimes uh, these ulcers um, uh, can lead to weakening of the inner lining of the intestinal tract. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's rare, but there is a possibility that there could be um, uh, a weakening of the intestinal tract and leading to a communication between two cavities. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not common in our setting, Crohn's disease, and, and so uh, it also would be rare to have fistulas associated with uh, Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. But uh, in and of itself, there is a possibility that that could happen. Mm -hmm. Maybe in a simpler term, Dr. Muticia, what is Crohn's disease to a local monanchi like me? Uh, now, in simple terms, Crohn's disease means... Uh, Number one, it's a disease of the intestinal tract, as mm -hmm. uh, my colleague has said. And uh, it, 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 it involves what you call inflammation. That means swelling. And now from the swelling, you, you have scarring subsequently. And when the swelling and subsequent scarring, which means formation of scars, the wall of the intestines is, inter is actually interfered with. The integrity of the wall is not the same as a wall that has not inflamed and then formed a scar. Mm -hmm. So that means there could be several implications. The first one is the wall will have basically grown weaker. Okay. So the chance of uh, a perforation through that particular scar is higher than in a place that has no scarring. And number two, it means that uh, the primary function of the intestine is interfered with, mm -hmm. which is absorption. Mm -hmm. Because once there's a formation of scar, the surface of the intestine that facilitates absorption is interfered with. Mm -hmm. So now the symptoms come about from those two, where there is malabsorption, I mean, that, that means poor absorption. You get symptoms like diarrhea or um, wastage. And of course, the patient becomes thinner because the, the nutrients that he's supposed to utilize through the absorption through the intestines are not being absorbed for utilization by the body. Mm -hmm. Now, the other symptoms now are symptoms that are related to fistulas within the intestines, which means leakages of uh, the stool matter into the cavity, um, leading to infections within the, the abdominal cavity, swellings, of course, pains. Mm -hmm. And if a fistula is between the intestine and the abdominal wall, now that can lead to leakage of stool through the abdominal wall into the outside. Mm -hmm. yes. Research has it that the Crohn's disease, it affects people in between the age of 13 and 30 years. Is there anything in there between the ages? Why not above 30? Yeah, as you said that, uh, you know, some of these conditions would, you, you'd really look at them in the, in the context of, uh, could there be a genetic predisposition? So okay. there are people who probably, because of their genes, they may be more predisposed. Um, and, and, and sometimes those age brackets are not cast on stone, but they could be basically saying that there is a, a peak between that age. Um, I think the other thing I'd also want to add is sometimes because of the, of the inflammation and the bleeding uh, from the ulcers within, uh, together with a condition called ulcerative colitis, it could be bleeding through the rectum or bleeding into the, uh, the, the intestinal tract. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these patients might notice dark stools or tarry stools 
um, and sometimes they might have anemia, and, and, and sometimes that might necessitate further tests uh, to exactly know um, whether this is ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease and how, how to treat that. But as you said, remember fistula is basically a communication between two cavities, mm -hmm. and usually there is a weakening of the surface between those two cavities. So in the Crohn's disease, there's a weakening of the wall of the intestinal tract, which allows uh, perforation and communication with another cavity. Mm -hmm. yes. Enough with the Crohn's disease. Now let's embark on obstetric fistula. Maybe a question from the students. My name is Chip Kiluito. I have three questions with me. Number one, can a repetitive UTIs cause fist obstetric fistula? And then number two, we found that this type of fistula it affects either a communication between the birth canal or with the bladder or with the rectum. And then here we find, uh, you find urine and feces. Uh, these are part of the, the products, the waste product that the body is excreting. So it may contain a lot of toxins that are unwanted in the body. But you find it come in contact with the birth canal. You know the birth canal and the other reproductive, reproductive parts of the female, they are being connected together. Can it of cause another disease or can it be a predisposing factor to other diseases? And then also now being affecting the reproductive part of the female, can it cause infertility in women? Mm -hmm. Let's speak the first question on repetitive UTIs. Fistulas, mm -hmm. do they cause UTI? So uh, fistulas in and of themselves um, do not cause, uh, UTIs, recurrent UTIs do not cause fistula. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the first question that you asked. Yeah. But women with fistulas can have recurrent UTIs. The reason is um, there is potential contamination from the vagina and from the rectum to tract up back through the fistula and into the bladder um, and sometimes into the ureter and to the kidney. So women with fistulas might um, have a risk of getting recurrent UTIs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe the second question was on birth canal. Yes, right? the second question was on the, on, on the sequelae, mm -hmm. the expected sequelae. That the first thing is that uh, urine in its own is sterile. That means uh, it does not cause infection on its own. The only thing it does is irritation. It uh, irritates the skin and also through the vaginal canal. Mm -hmm. But now feces are infectious. They have um, they have microorganisms in that, uh, as my colleague has spoken about, the commonest microorganism that causes UTI is called E. coli, and it originates from the feces. Mm -hmm. So that it itself will lead to in, um, the current UTIs within the rest of the um, of the of the urinary tract. Uh, on the last question, in terms of infertility, mm -hmm. I think uh, fistulas on themselves do not cause infertility. But what happens is that uh, a patient who has fistula because of the leakage of the stool or the urine into, through the vagina, may have difficulties in having sex. So it is from that that now leads to failure of conception. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't cause infertility. It doesn't cause infertility in, on its own. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. We have less than 10 minutes to go. Let me just pick some other questions again. My name is Faith Kemunto. Okay, on the causes of obstetric fistula, we've been talking of mainly prolonged labor. What about FGM? Does it cause obstetric fistula? <laughs> Does it, doctor? Um, obstetric uh, fistula basically refers to anything, uh, a fistula that happens around childbirth. So what we know with FGM is that it predisposes a woman to prolonged labor. So it's an indirect cause in the sense that a woman having had FGM uh, might have a difficult delivery. Maybe the baby is not able to come through. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that uh, difficult in, uh, difficulty in baby coming through actually predisposes a woman to prolong labor and subsequently to having a fistula. There are times when FGM is done, and, and this is not obstetric related, but is what we, we would still be terming as a potential uh, direct trauma. Mm -hmm. That sometimes FGM is done that you know, can p potentially cause damage to the bladder or damage to the rectum. And in severe cases, sometimes that allows a hole and a communication uh, between the, the two cavities. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I think at this juncture, even in the country, doing FGM or practicing FGM is illegal. It is illegal, actually. And uh, we, we, we recently had a, 
um, the Kenya Obstetrics and Gynecological Society actually reaffirmed that uh, it, our commitment to uh, fighting FGM mm -hmm. and actually also saying that um, it's something that should be um, basically awareness still needs to continue out there. Actually, it's not only discouraged, it's actually illegal and, and somebody can actually be um, taken to court for the same, either facilitating, abetting or conducting it. All right, let me pick some few questions from the students before we wrap up the show because we have less than six minutes to go. So my name's I'm David Magoma. I do have a question. So you've just talked about uh, obstetric surgery. So what's the efficacy of undergoing obstetric surgery in Kenya? Mm -hmm. um, I think I didn't get that question, but it's quite, quite broad. And you say efficacy, you're probably saying in relation to obstetric fistula. Mm -hmm. So because basically- I was lost what, in that term, efficacy? Efficacy, basically, we're talking about uh, um, how good is it in preventing? Um, I'm saying when they could res respond to that question. So obstetric fistula can be reduced uh, by performing a cesarean section. However, it's also good to know that it depends with how long the prolonged labor has been present mm -hmm. because that weakening of the tissues uh, might not be reduced by doing a, a cesarean delivery. It's also important to know that a cesarean delivery in itself, if it is complicated, and there's damage to the bladder or the ureter can also lead to a fistula. Mm -hmm. Maybe you. because of time strains, let me pick just la one last question from the audience. Uh, my name is Eno Konyango. My question is, uh, are uh, there platforms outside the medical camps for fistula repair and how affordable are they? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I did not get your question again. Maybe come up with your question. The question Loudest. is, uh, are there platforms outside medical camps for fistula repair and how affordable they? Oh, affordability. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, we have platforms that are outside camps. For example, in Kenyatta National Hospital, there is a fistula clinic that runs every Monday, and there's also a fistula surgical day mm -hmm. that runs every Tuesday. So patients are diagnosed and repaired as they come. Free of charge. Um, usually, the patients who are covered with NHIF, mm -hmm. they are paid for by NHIF. Okay. And I think there are some NGOs that come into, into sponsorship during those days, but I think it is better for the patient to confirm from the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe one last question from you. I saw you had some pressing issues on fistula. Do you still have a question? Okay. Yes, thank you. My name is Solomon Mayaka. Now, my question is like, uh, does fistula being precarious to women, for instance, they, when you maybe have given birth and then you delay, maybe you give birth today and then wait for five years, does that place a woman in, in a situation where she's likely to get fistula? Yeah, so um, there's no association between the interpregnancy period mm -hmm. and, and occurrence of fistula. It's usually, and especially obstetric fistula, it's most often than not related to the delivery itself, if there are complications at the point of delivery. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks a lot. But time is not by our side, but let me just take some quick parting shots from each and every one of you pertaining to fistula. Maybe I start with the Dr. Muticia. Uh, my parting shot is that uh, fistula is easily repairable mm -hmm. and treatable and curable. Mm -hmm. So any patient who is living with the stigma of fistula, they need to seek care. Mm -hmm. Because once they seek care, then the chances of them being uh, duly cured of their symptoms and their fistula is, is very high. Mm -hmm. So they should not shy away from seeking care. All right, Dr. Yes. Muriki, what's your parting shot on fistula? I think my parting shot is that fistula, uh, the, the problem of fistula does not just revolve around women. It actually revolves around uh, the society. Because please remember this woman who is ostracized and not able to take care of um, a family and fend for her family, that stigma itself prevents her from participating actively in society. So I think my, my parting shot would be um, uh, to, to do as much as we can, each and every one of us, to identify, support, and, and, and help these women who are suffering from fistula. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Muriki and Mutisa, for gracing our studios. Indeed, the pleasure is all ours. Even with you, the medical students, thanks a lot for your questions. And with that marks the end of Doctors on Call. Do have a lovely evening. My name is Sharon Ngao on Serio. Mm -hmm.